unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get-out-of-hell-free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts, and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real. It is living. It is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but He is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that He really died on the cross, and that He really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Welcome to your church. What a great night it is to spend with the Lord. I invite everyone to stand if you're willing and able and sing with us.
Thank you for singing. I can't get it right, sorry. <laughs> you're you're too low. Yeah. shelf back there is uh, we in the past have had a mission store and now we have a clearance sale so anything that's on any of those tables is available for any donation there's not going to be somebody saying no it costs more than that whatever uh, you put on there so make sure you look at that and grab something that you really need uh, you know I'm sure there's a lot of things all of us need on there but uh, uh, other than that and praying for people that we know let's let's go to the Lord in prayer gracious God we come to this place humbly broken and right now pretty hot we come here to realize that uh, it's really not about us at all we get a chance to come here and focus on you to be aware of your presence in our lives 
of the changes that get made in our lives because of that presence. And the way we are able to take those problems that are so important in our lives and move them back further so that we start to look at God first. And as we're able to see our problems through God, they look different. Maybe, God, if we could just be emissaries of your love and mercy and grace in our communities, there would be less violence. Maybe there would be less pain and suffering. Maybe there would be more equality for everyone. And you've called us. You've given us the command. And sometimes we fall short. So forgive us when we fall short and give us the strength to move forward as the children of God people that really believe what we say in the movie, that you really lived, that you were really crucified and killed, and that you really rose again, and you live and reign today to control, to guide, to lead us in this world as we go forward. Help us to pay attention to your call in our lives. Now bless us as we sing and have a good time and worship, that your words tonight will somehow reach us in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Tonight we'll be hearing from Ephesians, excuse me, from Romans in the fifth chapter. It's the first five verses. Therefore, since we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our hope of the sharing of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. So I entitled this message tonight, Experience, Strength, and Hope. That comes from something that is a story that really is long, but uh, on June the 8th, 2008, I came to this place. Uh, they had about 18 members, and uh, well, that night, that day, we had 60 in worship, but they were a bunch of my friends that came from the other church just to be here to support me. And the attitude was that, well, we're a great small church, and we're just gonna hang out being like we are, and they had these blankets and cushions and stuff on the pews. And they had the first nine front pews were padded, but the back nine didn't have any pads. And they didn't turn on the air conditioner until maybe 10.30 before an 11 o'clock service. And it was oh, uh, close to 90 in the sanctuary. And they didn't tell the preacher how to turn it on. And they wondered why they didn't have any guests. Uh, they, it was hot, and uh, they had had a part-time preacher for five years before that. And the part-time preacher sometimes showed up to five minutes before worship, and it was that everybody was just ready to die, and they were just hanging out until it was over. And so, uh, one of the first things I did was send out a letter. Said, "Do you really want to still?" They didn't have a membership role either. And so they said, uh, the, the discipline says we can use a church directory. So I got the directory out and I sent letters to everybody in there who some of these people that were here never heard of. And I got letters back said, please keep us on the roll so you can do our funeral. When we were at annual conference, uh, I think his name was Swanson, Bishop Swanson from the Georgia conference preached at our ordination service. And he, he talked about dead people. And he said, you know, dead churches are not worship, that's a funeral. And they really want a funeral. They just want somebody to get up there and tell them, look, I'm, I'm telling you, if you read this scripture, we've got it backwards. We do boast in our suffering all the time, don't we? When you run into somebody and you talk to them, how you doing? Oh man, my hip hurts, my leg hurts. <laughs> I'm having to have surgery. I don't have any energy. My family's sick, my mother's sick. We can quickly share all those stories. But that's not what the scripture says. If you pay attention, it says first, first, we're supposed to boast in the love of Jesus Christ that warms our heart. That's right. First. And then we're supposed to boast in our sufferings because we have endured them to get to where we are now. I always get tickled at that, that particular order that it says, you know, endurance makes hope and hope doesn't disappoint. Well, the thing is, we don't get to that kind of hope. We have a false hope that somehow or another we're going to elect the right person, we're going to join the right club, we're going to join the right church, and everything's going to be okay. That's right. And I got news for you. They can't fix it. Neither can the church fix it. Jesus Christ can fix it and will fix it when you start to concentrate on the love of Jesus Christ when it warms your heart. John Wesley, we watched the Wesley movie on May the 24th, 3rd, or something right around Aldersgate Day. John Wesley was a very typical Christian most of his life up until that point. He was trying to earn his way to heaven. He was trying to be good enough to get to heaven. Really, that's kind of how I grew up. I, I had this Santa Claus kind of version of faith. If you're just good, you get to go to heaven. Well, you know, when you're 12 or 13 or even 20 or 30, get to heaven, yeah, that's later. What I do now doesn't matter so much. That's right. Well, when you get to be in your 70s, let me tell you, later isn't that far away. And you start to wonder, I wonder if I would have made different decisions if I'd have got God involved in those decisions sooner. 
You often hear people when it comes to suffering say, if I'd have known I was going to live this long, I would have took a bit better care of myself. That's right. Well, the reality is we have that opportunity even now. It is never too late. Some years ago, we had a couple come to church here on Sunday, every Sunday, and uh, the, the wife said, would it be okay if we joined the church? And I said, well, I'll have to think about it. No, I said, it'll be fine. You can join. And they said, but I, I need to ask you, have you been baptized? And she said, well, yeah, I grew up Roman Catholic. I was baptized. I said, well, we count that. That's good. And her husband had not been baptized. He was in his 80s. And so I said, well, he and I need to have a conversation. So we visited for a bit. His name was Hank. And, and uh, I explained to him our version of what we understand about baptism. It's not what saves you, but it is a chance to publicly profess. I think the words we use, it's an inner and outward, it's an outward and visible sign of an inward and visible grace. Something like that. My tongue, I washed my tongue last night. I can't do a thing with it. But the, that's an old commercial for those of you that aren't old enough to remember. Uh, the... the uh, but, but anyway, Hank was willing and able and eager to be baptized. And we baptized him right here in front of this church. It probably wasn't, oh, maybe nine months later, his dementia would not have allowed him to make that decision. It's not too late to change. And he experienced the joy. One of the songs we sing a lot on Saturday night is, is you know, that, that every knee will bow. But those that do it now get to experience the joy. Oh, it, you know, it'll work. Constantine, we were having a conversation about him earlier. Constantine, he believed that his mother believed in God. He believed it enough that he put Christian symbols on all of his flags and swords and all that other stuff that they had to fight wars with. So, And he won when he did it, and he was a believer. But he wasn't willing to be baptized because he was afraid he would sin afterward. Yeah, well, he probably would have. But just because you sin doesn't mean you have to renounce your faith. It means that you have to realize it. You have to have, there's some kind of a delta between the time you do it and the time you reflect on it. And you think, well, maybe I should have been doing something different. How many of us have not said something we wish we could unsay? To somebody in a crowd. And it's right now, I think, is a, is a topical time for us to hear that. So the, the scripture says the first thing we're supposed to do is boast in the glory that God has given us, that heartwarming experience. And just like Wesley, some of us don't get it when we think we're going to get it. He went to a meeting on May the 24th to go to a place he didn't really like the people anymore. He didn't really want to go. He knew what they were going to be talking about. I mean, how many of you have got up and come to church and said, the preacher's going to preach another sermon about God? <laughs> and so this lay person was reading the preface to Romans, and, and according to the movie, and this comes right out of Wesley's journal, so I'm pretty sure it was true. Uh, somebody said, well, what's he doing? And Wesley actually said, I think he's reading the preface to Romans written by, John, by uh, Martin Luther. And Wesley was not a Martin Luther fan. But it was in hearing that message about faith that his heart was strangely warmed. I don't know what it takes for us to have that experience, but it was thanks to Wesley that we began to understand that experience is more than book learning. Being holy is more than knowing what the Bible says. Getting through tough times is part of life. I mean, we had tough times when we were in high school. I did, junior high school. I had a lot of tough times in high school. I had tough times in college and tough times in seminary. Tough times are just part of what happens. I got a book when we were cleaning up the other day. It's written by Robert Schuler. Tough times never last. Tough people always do. You would think a preacher might have said, God's people always do. But Schuler was a little questionable sometimes in his theology. I wonder really what difference it would make if we started to look at the world through God's eyes instead of through the eyes of, of, of a community, a particular community, a particular culture, a particular race, a particular political party. I mean, i got really good friends that are on all sides of every political issue. And they're still good friends. And we don't, we don't even have that rule about we can't talk about it. We do sometimes talk about it. And sometimes they make a good point. And sometimes they're talking out of their ears. <laughs> but, but, you know, whatever they say is whatever they say. Who they are is who they are. My instructions from this book or to love them no matter who they are or what they do. To love people no matter how they look. 
I wrestle with that one. I grew up in a time when, you know, I didn't see many people with tattoos on their face or piercings everywhere. I don't have anything against it. It's just odd to me. I don't understand why you'd want to do that. But somehow I have to realize it's the inner stuff that I'm supposed to be looking at, not the outer stuff. It's, the, it's who they are. And somebody, if, if not me, who? Somebody's got to believe that God really created them for some purpose. And if that purpose is real, then they need to determine that purpose. They've got to figure it out. They've got to feel it in their heart. And then they've got to try to live it out. John Bradshaw was a, a former pastor, theologian type, also a, a self-help guy. And he said it a different way. He said he was concerned that most people would go to the grave with their music unplayed. You know, what is your music? I know we at the church, we make a lot of mistakes. You know, somebody comes here and they're a school teacher who says, oh, well, you need to be teaching Sunday school. Or they come and they've been a banker in their past, so well, you need to be on the finance committee. You know, that's not always true. Sometimes the guy that was in the finance committee wants to be the janitor now. He wants a job where he doesn't have to do that stuff. We pay very little attention to what God's calling people to do. And then on the other side of that, we kept new members. Sometimes one church I served, we gave them a list. It was an eight and a half by 14 sheet piece of paper. Single space, both sides, with all the ministries provided to the church. And we said, you have to pick some. Well, you look at that, I just want to serve God. I don't know if it means working in Sunday school or if it means uh, being a, a, a trustee. I don't know any of that stuff. So many people don't know. And so we, we tend to pigeonhole people and put them in places. And, and sometimes it's the endurance and the suffering that has led them to be in a place where they can be useful and helpful to somebody now. That's right. Sometimes uh, I, I learned that, I guess, really more in AA than I did in church. When the challenge is to take the message that you learned to help you get sober with and share it with other people. I know we Methodists haven't always been very evangelistic. But maybe we need to be. Maybe even in our suffering we can share the grace and mercy and love of Christ. Maybe when times get tough, it's time for us to stand up and say, yeah, we'll get through it. There's a lot of people talking about the, the dilemmas in the church right now. And it's not just the Methodist church. If you've been listening to the news, the Baptist church has got issues. We knew the Catholic church had issues. There's a lot of issues. The church is a human construct of an attempt to follow God. And sometimes they, the church doesn't get it right. And, and sometimes the church makes mistakes. The church really is supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's supposed to be doing God's work in the community. I really believe if we were doing, if all of our churches were unified, in, and I don't mean the same, if we were unified in the Spirit of God, that we wouldn't need government welfare because the churches would be taking care of the people in their community. I really believe if we stepped up and did what Christ called us to do, we'd be able to change this world. But we've got to have this hope that He's talking about here in the Scripture, this hope that surpasses understanding, this hope that comes from, because we know, we know who God is. We know what Christ has called us to do. It wasn't the great suggestion. It was the great commandment. Go out and make disciples. Go out and share your experience, strength, and hope with others. I got to experience that a lot when I was doing 38 sessions of radiation at 1 o'clock every single day, the weekday. Cancer takes a weekend off, by the way. You don't have to go on the weekend. But uh, every day I would go over there and, and uh, I was sitting with these guys, and so many of them were in way worse shape and had worse stuff going on than I did. And we would sit around there, and we would share, well, you know, so you're in week number what? What side effects have you had? What's happened to you? What's going on in your life? Because it's useful to hear it from somebody that's been there. I have a friend right now, his wife has a torn rotator cuff. He said, well, the doctor said she needs surgery. I said, yeah, I had that. The doctor in 2018, the doctor told me I was going to need surgery, but he was going to wait as long as he could because it's a debilitating surgery. He said, oh no, the doctor's going to jump right into surgery. I said, I bet you. He doesn't. They're going to try a lot of stuff first because the last thing they want to do is paralyze you for a year if they can avoid it. And so many of us look at that and we say, well, we're, we're, we're held up and captive by our, by our health insurance. Look, 
they've got this figured out. Sometimes the best thing to do isn't to cut on you. Sometimes the best thing to do isn't to have an immediate answer. Sometimes you have to live through some of the difficulties and the troubles that go along with it. I lift weights every day. I well, almost every day. I used to not be a weightlifting person. But I got interested in it when I couldn't pick up a one pound and lift it up with my right arm after my surgery. I'm all the way up to five pounds. But I can do it now, 50 times. Any way you want to do it. I can lift it this way, this way, any way you want to lift it. And you know what, what he's talking about here is that endurance builds character. And character builds strength. And strength then gives you hope. You can't be hopeful if you have none of those other things. You can't be hopeful if you don't believe that if you people, Christians, we're all claiming to be that, if we don't believe that Jesus Christ can really redeem the world, then what in the heck are we doing here? If we believe it, then shouldn't we join forces with Him to make it so? Shouldn't we be doing something more? And I know it's easy to get caught up in your own stuff. You can sit there and say, well, you know, I'm too busy or I don't have time. Well, you know, yeah, we're all busy. I'm not talking about going out and doing like the, the Jehovah's Witnesses do and banging on doors. I'm talking about going wherever you go, living wherever you live, doing whoever you talk to, and being a hopeful person in the group. Being a person in the group that believes that there's a better tomorrow ahead. I know when you're filling up your car and it costs 50 bucks, my car only holds 10 gallons. Uh, it's hard to be hopeful. But then again, I'm pretty grateful that we don't have bombs flying overhead and that I get to go wherever I want to go and I get to do the things I want to do. And, and so sometimes I lose sight of the fact that really I am incredibly blessed. And that Spirit of God within me tells me that somehow or another I need to be a blessing too. How about you? Do you, do you have those thoughts sometimes? One of the great things about you being United Methodist, and this is one of the great things, there are many, is that when you go past that guy on the street corner out there and you're having those thoughts in your head, should I, should I give, give him a dollar? Or should I buy a bottle of that water? I really want to help people. I really do, but is, is he the right guy to help? You know, is he making 80 grand a year standing on the corner selling a bottle of water? And he might be. But because of UMCOR and because of the things we do as a church, we have places like the Wesley Community Center up there in Northeast Houston that are taking people that are unemployable and teaching them how to be, uh, first thing is just how to be financially stable. And then once they get there, they're giving them some skills and they're working with other organizations like Methodist Hospital to get them jobs as a CNA or whatever. That's happening because of us. This is right now, Lakeview is gonna be full of kids. Starting this week, I believe, they'll be at camp. Somewhere every year, around 3,500 adults and children from our conference go to camp at Lakeview. If you hang around long and hear the stories, talk to the counselors, they went as a kid. You talk to the parents, you talk to the preachers that are now going there. Many of them had their first call to ministry at summer camp. When we get kids isolated, you know, they're away from for the most part from their phone, not by any design, but phones just don't work at Lakeview. We get them up there where their main focus in life is to be in community. You know, whether you admit it or not, friends, what you really want in life is a community. That's right. What you want is a group of people that care if you're sick, somebody that you can call. When I was a single dad, <laughs> I found out how important community was. I was kind of isolated. I'd been through a divorce. When I went up to the church, everybody wanted to ask me how my ex-wife was. It wasn't all that pleasant. So I didn't go very much. And so I came home from a meeting one time with a kidney infection. I didn't know that's what I had, but I thought I was gonna die. I was pretty sure I was gonna die. And I called, I had to call a friend. I didn't feel like driving, so I, kids weren't old enough to drive. I called a friend to drive me to the doctor. They did. Did they wait? No, they left. So here I am at the doctor's office after the doctor told me I need to go down to Walgreens to get a prescription filled and I need to do it quickly before they close and I have no car. And I had to call another friend that was willing to come get me and I realized pretty quick I was not in a community of people that I could get depend on. Are you? Do you have a group of people you can call if you need a ride or if your car's broke? 
that you can ask. I'm not talking about asking them for money. I'm talking about really simpler stuff than that. You know, somebody that you could call and say, hey, I'm in the middle of cooking something and I need a pound of sugar and they live two doors, two doors down. Can you get it? Do you even know your neighbors? Do you even know what they think, what they eat, what they care about, what language they speak? It, this call from God on our community, this thing about having this love of Christ in your heart is really about being what Jesus was, somebody that goes out and interacts with people that are not like him. He did a lot of that. The people like him were the ones sitting up in the synagogue telling him he had it all wrong. They were easy to criticize him because they didn't want to be doing the kind of ministry he did. They didn't want to hang out with the poor people, with the lepers. It's easy to be like that, isn't it? You want to hang out with people that look like you do, think like you do, vote like you do? I gotta tell you, if that's what you do, you're isolating yourself, you're missing out. I want to read this again. Maybe you'll hear it a little bit differently now. Therefore, since we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Now, if we do that, then it says, and not only that, but we also boast in our suffering. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts with the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. I grew up in the Methodist Church. When I call us the frozen chosen, it's from experience. Most churches, not so much nowadays, the ones I grew up in, everything was bolted down. You couldn't move a pew. You couldn't move the altar. You couldn't move anything. We used to have a rail in front of ours to keep people away from the holy place. Preacher told me one time, he says, go fill up the, the baptismal font with water. I said, well, where do you get holy water? He said, out of the faucet. <laughs> I, I really thought everything was special somehow. You know, it is special. But it becomes special because of the community and the way we bless it and care for it and what, we, what it means to us. And I think that's that's kind of where we miss out sometimes. We we think that the church has to be a certain way or something has to happen a certain way. You know, I'm not a big guy. I don't. I mean, I'm not big on some of the music that we sing sometimes, like at annual conference. Uh, but I know there's a lot of people that are. Uh, I like that when we sing "Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King," the old songs that I'm used to singing. That I like that. I always have loved Chris because he brings those to us in, with a guitar. Many of these songs were designed, Silent Night was meant to be something to guitar. But God's love really means to me that I have to be different than I want to be. That I have to be like He wants me to be, not like I want to be. And sometimes I can share my strength. Sometimes I can share the troubles I've had. Not to get sympathy, but to let you know that, you know what? There is light at the end of the tunnel. And it is not a train. It's the glory and power of God. And I want everybody I know to experience that. I want everybody I know to share that. In the Methodist Church for years, our membership vows were, you could join the church with your prayers, presence, gifts, and service. I mean, that was that way for years. And it was fairly recently that we added witness to the end. I wonder why we missed that before. It's important for us to pray, and I hope y'all pray for me, I pray for you, and we pray for each other. It's important for you to be here, because you don't know how your strength to be here in spite of your suffering might affect somebody else. And your gifts are not just your monetary gifts, it's your time, your treasure, your talents, everything you've got to give. But really, none of that stuff matters if you don't witness. Does being a child of God make you different than anybody else. To realize that they too are a child of God make you treat them any different. I just wonder what it would be like, how long it'll take us to do what God is calling us to do. Because I believe God, I believe, truly believe that Jesus is coming back, but I also believe He says, you guys got some work to do. That's right. And when you do the work, I'll be there with you to do it, and I'll be there to welcome you home. When it's done.
In our service, as you know, or you may not know, we serve communion every Saturday night. Uh, in the United Methodist Church, everyone is invited to come to communion. It's not held out. We don't do a membership check or baptism check. Uh, we believe that there's some mystery, a holy mystery we call it, and the grace given to us through celebrating communion. It's one of our two sacraments. And we invite you to come in just a minute as we pray together. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we hear these words and we realize we've spent way more time suffering than praising you. We talk about it. We feel it in our bones. Forgive us. Forgive us for being self-centered, thinking somehow or another that anything revolves around us. And tonight, free us from that. So that when we walk down this aisle and we come to accept this bread, dipped in this grape juice, that we, we experience the gift of free grace given to us through the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Once again, we'll hold out our hands and we'll say, we we'll, won't say anything, but we'll welcome the gift into our hands. We're accepting Jesus Christ even tonight. We may have done it a hundred times before, or maybe a thousand times before, but tonight, God, as we accept you into our hands and we take it into our bodies, somehow let it become part of who we are. There were people capable of understanding the suffering makes endurance. Endurance gives us character. Character gives us hope. And it's the hope of Jesus Christ. Tonight as we come to this table, make this bread and this cup come for us the body and blood of Christ. As we take it into our bodies, we celebrate the joy of eternity given to us by Christ. We celebrate together at this table as we will someday celebrate at a table with unlimited seating. Thank you for the gift that you've given us of Jesus Christ. Until we all gather together at your holy table. It's in your name we pray. Amen. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? When we share the cup, this is not a sharing in the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The cup given freely to those present on that night on His Last Supper and given to you freely tonight. I want to invite Chris to come first. We have a bucket up here for a communion offering. Uh, it's just our mission money. If you have nickels, dimes, and quarter, it's a spare change kind of a thing. Our regular offering basket is in the back. And my too. Not just Chris. Friends, the table is prepared. Uh, the way we're serving communion right now is I will dip the bread into the grape juice and hand it to you. So if you just come with your hands like this, we'll work it out just fine. You're invited to come. The prayer rails are here if you choose to pray after you receive. Come as you will.
share our experience, our strength, our hope. Let's go do it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, the offering baskets in the back. We're glad to accept your gift, tithes, and offering. Don't forget to look at the tables in the back. Make a donation. Take something home. God bless you. We'll see you all next week.